Hey guys, this is part three of three of this uh, early Ottoman period that we've been covering. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Uh, this one is the climax of this part of the story. If you like what you've been hearing so far, please make sure to follow Preoccupation Pod on Instagram and subscribe to wherever you are listening to this, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher. Uh, really helps get the program out to everyone who needs to hear it. And here we go. Jerusalem has long been the focal point of the still unsolved problem of Palestine. There is no Palestine, no Palestinians. There never was, there never will be. All right, we have finally arrived at our last stop in our tour of early Ottoman Palestine. And our last stop is the northern Sanjak of Safad. I, I, I put an extra emphasis on Sanjak because we are not just exploring the city of Safad, but also the surrounding areas that constitute what we understand today to be the Galilee. So essentially the entirety of the north of Palestine. And right off the bat... In this Sanjak, we see something so unique in this region, so peculiar even for this time, that even a Palestinian traveling through Safad at this time would have found this next bit of information strange. Dating back to at least the 17th century, and, and honestly, po possibly even beyond that, Safad is home to at least a dozen French merchants and at least one Dutch merchant. Now, this is at a time where that kind of thing really was just not normal. People did not simply leave their homes to live off in some faraway land where people practiced a religion that they did not practice. In fact, Christian Europe had taken an enormous risk in sailing across the Atlantic with the intended purpose of avoiding the Ottoman Empire in the first place in their quest for a new route to India. And the reason for their presence in the northern Sanjak of Safad at that time boils down to something called the Capitulations. The Capitulations were a series of bilateral agreements between the Ottoman Empire and the Christian kingdoms of Europe. As I just mentioned, the Christian kingdoms of Europe generally wanted to avoid doing business with and doing business within the Ottoman Empire. And this is rooted in the their understanding of Islam at the time, that the Sharia was going to result in their deaths, and that they weren't going to be safe traveling through the Ottoman Empire, and, and, and. So the Ottoman Empire, being the business-savvy empire that it was, wanted to continue doing business with Christian Europe. And so they signed a series of bilateral agreements, which essentially granted Christian European merchants a sort of diplomatic immunity. To put it simply, a Christian merchant from what we consider today to be France or a Venetian mer merchant or someone of that sort, or in one famous case, a Dutch merchant, could reside in the Ottoman Empire or travel through the Ottoman Empire. And if they were convicted of a crime, they would be judged back either back in their home country or in accordance with the laws of their home country. Now, these capitulations at this point are about a hundred years old within the Ottoman Empire, but are very new to the Palestinians. At this stage also, the capitulations do not play a massive role in the history of Palestine. They will play a monumentous role in the history of Palestine later. 
Now, one thing I hammered home in the first two parts of this three-part episode is the importance of understanding power dynamics. And buried into my diatribes is the assertion that these institutions of power tribes, houses, clans, it doesn't matter what we call them at this point right now, they need to project violence outward and inward. I also ranted in episode one about the role that stories play in bringing these groups together. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly is the primary adhesive that keeps groups together. But another adhesive that that keeps groups together is wealth. We saw that tremendously with the merchants of Nablus. So just think for a moment, what are the actual responsibilities of a clan chief? They will arbitrate between warring parties, no doubt. They will reprimand clan members somewhere and bestow favors upon other members in other places. Okay, no doubt. But in addition to all of that, the leader of a clan needs to make sure that the members of the clan have enough to eat, that their bellies are full, and without wealth, members will slowly fail to see the virtue of staying together. The chief will no longer be able to rally his forces for the defense of the clan, and you will no longer be able to control the behavior behavior of your tribe's members. Slowly, the story that brought them together in the first place will not be enough to keep them together. Well, in an agrarian society, wealth requires land ownership more often than not. So what do you do? What do you do if your tribe either possesses an insignificant amount of land or the land in your throne village becomes infertile? Well, in Ottoman Palestine, there were a few alternative sources of income that these tribes who find themselves in these situations could pursue. One way that they could earn a living that was very popular among the Bedouin tribes of that time was brigandry, robbery, highway robbery. Just live by raiding and pillaging, and that's a pretty risky way to live. Now, on the other hand, if you're lucky, if you're the Husseinis of Jerusalem, and you derive your wealth from the holy sites that you manage and the religious services that you provide, This isn't really a problem for you, but that door isn't open for everyone. I mean, maybe you could be like the people of Nablus and become merchants, but the merchant class of Nablus was born out of the delicate balance of power that existed in that town. The trust that existed between the merchants and the powerful peasant clans was earned over decades. And if you need to feed your family now, you just can't wait that long to develop a good reputation as a trustworthy merchant family. So what do you do? Well, one other avenue that was open to clans and tribes was tax farming. This is kind of a funny word for an institution that, as far as we can tell, no longer exists. Collecting taxes has always been and continues to be a cumbersome affair. This continues to be the case even in the modern era. Just ask anyone who works for the IRS or Canada Revenue. Anyways, in Ottoman Palestine, the empire dealt with this business by appointing tax farmers. Clans would essentially bid on their right to administer and collect the taxes in their administrative zone on behalf of the empire. Now, they would collect more than what was needed, more than what the sultan actually demanded, and they would keep the rest. A tax farmer in Ottoman Palestine was called a multezim. And one tribe that survived on tax farming was the Zaydani tribe, who were natives to Safuria in the Safad Sanjak. This Safad Sanjak also included the tribes of Akka and Nasra, so Acre, Nazareth, Tabariya, Tiberias, and the most ambitious and cunning and motivated among the Zaydanis was a man named Zahir al-Umar. Zahir al-Umar became a tax farmer for the Zaydani tribe when he was just 11 years old. And what that means is that he was literate, he was articulate, and he was ambitious. You need to understand what was happening economically and socially at this time. I don't know if all history works like this, but the history of Palestine really 
can be described as a history of unintended consequences. Little incidents have massive ripples that no one could have predicted. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the way that the world looks for the people of this era. A few hundred years before the incidents that we are describing at this moment, European explorers began searching for a new way to reach India. I alluded to that a few moments earlier. Well, why were they looking for new routes to to reach India? To avoid the Ottoman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. This gamble ends up paying off multiple fold and wealth is beginning to shift from the Muslim world to Christian Europe. And now Europe has a new found appetite for Middle Eastern cotton to feed their new addiction for nice clothes and nice things. The British are primarily sourcing their cotton from Egypt, while the French are mostly getting their cotton from Palestine. This is a time where the cotton exports of Palestine are absolutely booming. The cotton industry is exploding, it is growing, and it is growing fast. And the center of this cotton industry is the Safad Sanjak. Now, now, something really small happens that ends up having a massive, massive impact. I've said a few times that the Ottoman Empire governed the Sanjaks of Palestine by appointing indigenous tribes to rule on their behalf. Well, since the arrival of the Ottoman Empire in the early 16th century, the Safad Sanjak was ruled by the Turebi tribe in northern Palestine. And for reasons that I have not been able to figure out, it could possibly be due to the exploding cotton trade, the Ottomans decide to depose the Turebi tribe and to try to rearrange the Safad Sanjak to put more direct control over the region. But the Ottoman Empire never fully establishes direct control in this northern Sanjak. And what that means is that their deposing of the Turebi tribe ended up creating something of a power vacuum. And power is this force of energy that needs to find a home. Power will never just dissipate into thin air. Whenever it is up for grabs, someone will reach out and grab it. And the Zaydani tribe did precisely that. Zahir al-Umar and his tribe, through a series of bribes and lobbying and negotiations, end up becoming the rulers of the Safad Sanjak. And this is the beginning This is the event that precipitates the rise of Zahir al-Umar, who we will call by the end of this episode, the founding father of modern Palestine. There is something that needs to be said at this point about people of ambition and fate. And there are really two types of people who deal with the subject of fate and destiny. There are those who wait for it to arrive at their doorstep, and there are those who go and create the opportunities and allow fate to reveal itself to them. Zahir al-Umar was definitely the latter. He was the kind to go out and look for it. Now remember a few moments ago where I said that the history of Palestine can best be described as a history of unintended consequences? Well, I'm going to tell you about another one of those incidents that sounds so insignificant. You remember those few dozen merchants that live in the north of Palestine? Many of them live in the town of Nazareth. Well, they convince the peasants of Nazareth to begin cultivating the Marj ibn Amr region, which is just south of Nazareth. This is in what we call the what what is called today the Jezreel Valley. It is one of the most fertile regions in Palestine. So it's quite simple really. Begin cultivating that region, you will yield a better return. In an agrarian time among an agrarian people, this is an absolute gold mine. And it's a no-brainer. There is only one problem. Another people lay claim to the Marj ibn Amr region. And it's not just any people, but it is the Leviathans of Nablus. Powerful families, the influential merchants of Nablus, with tentacles that reach as far as Damascus and Cairo. The Fallahin of Nablus, with their peasant militias nestled neatly into the mountains. Yes, that Nablus. They are the ones who control the Marj ibn Amr region. Or at least, they are the ones who lay claim to it. Now, 
If you look on a map of Palestine, you'll see that the Merj ibn Amr region is much closer to Nazareth. Still, Nablus was not pleased, to say the least, and this issue needed to be resolved. And so, the representatives of, the, of Nazareth and the ne- representatives of Nablus decided to resolve this issue in the Sharia court based in Jenin. Now understand that Jenin at this point is in the Nablus Sanjak. And if you recall what I said at the end of the last episode, uh, Nablus had a tendency to fill its courts with local officials who may be related to the tribes of Nablus. In fact, in all likelihood, are members of the tribes of Nablus. And so you would be right to suspect that maybe Jenin is not the most fair place to hold arbitrations. Well, to your surprise, and to the surprise of the chiefs of Nablus, the Qadi of Jenin rules that the Merz ibn Amr region belongs to the Safad Sanjak, not to Nablus. Now remember that at this point there is no massive Ottoman police presence that A. obligates people to use the courts in the first place and B. uses tools of coercion to force people to accept the outcome of a court ruling. People simply did this because of the societal carrots and sticks that came with disobeying the courts. People obeyed the courts because the alternative was much worse. I mean, it really came down to a simple question. Would you like to use the court's ruling, or do you choose violence? And the tribes of Nablus said, we choose violence. The rallying cry went out to the tribes of Nablus that we are not going to let the Merj ibn Amr region be stolen from us, and we are going to descend upon and steamroll Nazareth. This effort was spearheaded by the Jarrar clan. Arguably the most powerful of the peasant families with the most powerful peasant militia at its disposal. Well, in swoops Zahir al-Umar al-Zaydani, who decides this is the time to take a stand. And he is going to defend the town of Nazareth. He is going to take up their cause and he comes in backed by his Bedouin allies of Benu Saqr and decides to champion the cause of his Sanjak. You know, we don't have a ton of information about Zahir al-Umar's character. We don't know what type of person he was in his personal life. We don't have his memoirs. So I have to make an inference as to what type of person he was from the information I have available and from the multiple moves that he was making at that time. And I think without a shadow of a doubt, he was waiting for a pretext to pounce. He was a man of ambition and he was preparing to make moves of conquest. And this was just his first major move. He comes in on the side of Nazareth and he pushes Nablus back. As one historian describes it, quote, Initially, the Jarrar clan bore the brunt of the military and political pressures because their territories lay between northern and central Palestine. The first major armed confrontation was over control of the Merj ibn Amr region and the market town of Nazareth. In 1735, Jarrars were defeated by Zahir al-Umar and their leader, Sheikh Ibrahim, was killed in the battle. Nazareth, which had previously paid taxes to the Jarrar clan, became part of Zahir al-Umar's domains. End quote. So Zahir al-Umar does that, but not only does he do that, he makes one further move. He tells the people of Nazareth, Come rally behind me. I will be your protector. And I will ensure that if you give me a monopoly over your cotton export, I will make you wealthy beyond your wildest imagination. I have spoken so much about how alliances at this time are kinship-based alliances rooted in power and coercion. But Zahir al-Umar's arrival onto the scene introduces a whole new type of power structure. He's using the incentives of capitalism. He's telling Nazareth, give me a monopoly over your cotton exports and I will turn your sleepy little pilgrimage town into a city. And they accept. 
And the peasants of Nazareth rally behind him, and he begins to make very ambitious moves. 1735 marks Dahar al-Umar's conquest of Nazareth, and it goes from being a little pilgrimage village for Christian pilgrims all over the world. Of 300 people resided in Nazareth in 1735. It explodes to a city of 20,000 20, people under the rule of Dahar al-Umar. Not only that but it becomes the site for numerous churches and monasteries for various Christian denominations. Which brings us to another characteristic of Dahar al-Umar's rule, his relationship with the Christians and Jews. Now, he was looked upon very favorably by these communities. The Christians of northern Palestine loved him and trusted him. And as for the Jews, well, the very next year, he goes on to, con to conquer Tabariya, Tiberias, And right after that, he sends out a correspondence to the chief rabbi of Izmir. And according to Professor Mahmoud Yazbak of the University of Haifa, he says, quote, Dahar al-Umar reached out to Rabbi Hayyam bin Jacob Abu al-Afiya of Izmir and invited him and his co-religionists to come and settle in Tiberias. Upon their arrival in 1740, Dahar al-Umar personally welcomed the Izmir Jews and provided them with land to build their own quarter around the synagogue and the school he helped them constru construct. As an extra incentive for them to quickly set up trade, Dahar al-Umar gave them a three-year tax exemption. End quote. So you see, Dahar al-Umar is not just using the old tribal alliances that people were accustomed to using at that time. He's using new alliances. He's bringing in non-Muslims from outside of Palestine, settling them in Palestine, and using tax incentives in order to motivate them to engage in trade and commerce. This is very forward thinking for the mid to late 18th century. By the way, a complete side note here, but those Jews living in Safad in the 18th century will indigenize, Arabize, and be thought of as Palestinian Jews in the 20th century. And this is, this is important. Just keep that in mind for later. Now, remember a few moments ago, I said that Dahar al-Umar was not the type of person to wait around for opportunities. Well, the next time we see Dahar al-Umar after the conquest of Tabariya, he has added 1,000 Maghrabi mercenary warriors to his fighting force. And this further consolidates his power. Not only does he have the, ba the backing of Banu Saqr and his own tribe and the families and towns that he has conquered, but he has also added these battle-hearted mercenaries ready to knock down one town after another. By 1749, not only has he taken places like Haifa, but he has now reached the town of Akka, Acre. In the 18th century, Acre was yet another one of these sleepy towns of 300 fishermen, but it did have a functioning port. And Dahar al-Umar needed more ports for his cotton exports. Now he has the ports of Haifa and the port of Acre. And, and though Dahar al-Umar's fighting capability has rapidly improved, Akka actually falls without resistance. And this is partially because one of Dahar al-Umar's primary, primary rivals at this time, a man named Suleiman Pasha, dies while Dahir al-Umar is marching toward Acre. And now that he is in charge, Acre begins attracting greater numbers of British, French, and Dutch merchants. And now with his meteoric rise in power, on display for the world to see, he can begin establishing diplomatic relationships with these European kingdoms directly, without the Ottoman Empire as a middleman. This creates a problem, because Dahir al-Umar is now engaged in direct negotiations and is seen externally, outside of the Ottoman Empire, as a type of sovereign. And, and, and before I say anything else about that, I just want to, to give a nod to the to the economic foresight of this guy. Again, I don't know anything about his personal character. I don't know if he was a degenerate. I don't know if he was a bad guy. I can only judge by his actions. And and just a nod to his economic acumen, his grit, his determination. Acre, much like Nazareth, explodes to 20,000 people by 1760 under the reign of Dahir al-Umar. 
But at this point, Zahir al-Umar has been attracting the unwanted attention of Ottoman authorities, and he's been doing this for decades. And it must be clarified here that despite his conflicts with Ottoman subjects like the governors of Syria, and despite the fact that he clashed with the empire directly, Zahar al-Umar was not actually challenging the empire's legitimacy or sovereignty. What he was fighting for in many ways was the right to represent the empire and to rule on behalf of the empire whether they liked it or not. As Ilan Pape puts it, quote, it should be understood that what appeared to be the crumbling of imperial, imperial control was in reality a struggle for representation of the empire and the collection of its taxes rather than to displace it as the sovereign power. When a local potentate sought a larger share of the tax revenue, he was not actually challenging the empire. Istanbul's decentralized, delegated power made such moves possible. End quote. But just like the story of Icarus, it's generally not very good to fly too close to the sun. And Zahir al-Umar has been flying right along the surface of the sun for decades. The Ottoman Empire dispatches Uthman Pasha, the new wali of Damascus, to put the hammer down on Zahir al-Umar. By now, though, he has woven alliances with forces all over the region, including Egypt, and he pushes Uthman's forces back. After this, the Ottoman Empire is forced to recognize Zahir al-Umar as the Sheikh of Palestine. They don't want to give him an official title like Sultan or Emir. These are titles that grant certain authorities that they are not interested in granting him. And so they give him the title of the Sheikh of Akka and Haifa and so on. And now in the 1770s, Zahir al-Umar is either in indirect or direct control over the entirety of what we understand today to be Palestine, that is, everything between the river and the sea. The local heavyweights of Nablus could not stop him, and in fact, the Tuqan family of Nablus, one of the most powerful merchant families in the city, only have one port that they can use that is free from the influence and control and power of Zahir al-Umar, and that is the port of Yaffa. And maybe this next bit, maybe this is an effort to extend his monopoly, or perhaps it's just out of out of pettiness. But Zahir al-Umar takes over Yaffa as well. Now, the reason that I think that Zahir al-Umar is undoubtedly the founding father of modern Palestine is that he is instrumental in creating what I call the Palestine frozen in time. Is it is it is during his rule that we see something that had not happened since the time of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, since the first Crusades. We have not seen the repopulation of the Palestinian coastline by Palestinians. For the first time in nearly 500 years, Palestinians feel safe residing in the coast. Yaffa, Haifa, Akka, these are all coastal cities, and they are all repopulated during the reign of Zahir al-Umar. He is also the founding father of modern Palestine because he ruled over nearly the entire area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. And so his economic policies, which resulted in the mass movement of people between these towns and, and these regions created in the process new families, new dynamics, and allowed for the emergence of an urban class in the 19th century. Now, some Palestinians who have been listening to this series must have wondered about the emergence of what we call the Medani class, the urban class. I keep mentioning the Falahi class, the peasants, and the Bedouin class, the Bedouins, but I have not mentioned the Medani class at all. And in many, and in many cases, that class emerges out of Zahir al-Umar's economic policies and the urban booms that followed. These people were leaving behind their old... The people who were going into these towns, they were leaving behind the old family alliances of their villages to pursue new ventures and new opportunities together and to build new communities. And this creates an environment that makes it possible 
possible to have a national story. Now, for decades, Zahir al-Umar successfully navigated the corridors of power between Cairo and Damascus and Istanbul. He was outmaneuvering the governors and generals of the time. What he did so well was all of the things that I mentioned. What he did not so well was manage his children. Over time, the sons of Zahir al-Umar would grow to rival him. He would reconcile with them, and then they would rebel against him again. And so they would reconcile, and they would rebel, and this continued until it began to create gaps in his armor. In 1773, maybe Zahir al-Umar saw that the situation was fracturing. He needed a way to negotiate with Damascus to unload some of the pressure that comes with fighting a war on literally every front for 40 years. And when he looked for someone to arbitrate between him and the new governor of Damascus, Muhammad Adam, he needed a, a neutral but trustworthy family. He needed a family whose honor and integrity was both real and well known. And so he reached out to the Husseinis of Jerusalem. And, th and this was a smart move, I mean, considering that the Husseinis were actually favorable to Dahar's reign. Uthman Pasha, the previous wali of Damascus, and one of Zahir al-Umar's greatest rivals, heavily taxed these Jerusalem notables, and they hated him immensely. To such an extent that at one point, the Husseinis had sent a private, private correspondent to Zahir al-Umar, essentially supporting his rule. But times were changing, and by 1773, it looked like this 40-year reign of Zahir al-Umar was reaching its expiry date. Seeing that the rival Jerusalem families were not picking a side in these conflicts, the Husseinis felt that it was safer to not get involved in a battle between giants. And so they refused to play the role of arbitrator. In 1775, a former mercenary ally of Zahir al-Umar, a man named Jazar Pasha, succeeds in overpowering and outmaneuvering him, Zahir al-Umar succumbs to a small case of death in 1775, and the reign of one of Palestine's most powerful leaders ends in a hail of cannon fire. Now, Zahir al-Umar, aside from being the founding father of modern Palestine, is without a doubt the most famous Palestinian you've never heard of. Even if you are Palestinian, unless you are a history nut, unless you are a fanatic, you probably have never heard of this guy. Uh, I have said before, I've uttered these words. I've, I've said that I know more about Palestine than I know about any other subject. And so imagine, to my great surprise, and, and honestly, a blow to my, to my self-esteem, when I discovered that this guy existed. I had never heard of him. And the average Palestinian has never heard of him. And so the average person in the, the Arab and Muslim world has never heard of him. How is that possible? And, and, and I've done some research on this in the sense that I've gone around and asked other people who I felt were familiar with Palestine, with the Palestinian people, Palestinian history. Have you ever heard of Zahir al-Umar? Nobody's ever heard of this guy. And there are a few reasons why. I mean, for one, our research regarding Palestine, the collective research that has been done regarding Palestine, is almost always framed within the context of the arrival of the Zionists. Everyone is always looking for an angle to see where do the Zionists fit into this? Where does the interaction with the Zionists fit in? And it's not always the story. There is a Palestinian peoplehood that is separate of the Zionist conflict. But it's not just that. There's something else looming over the horizon. In 1775, Zahir al-Umar dies. And in 1799, a little French general by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte arrives at the port of Jaffa. He will soon lay siege to Akka. Algeria will soon fall. Egypt is already under the process of European colonization. India is under the process of European colonization. 
the age of European colonialism has descended upon the shores of Palestine and throughout the 19th century, Palestine will undergo change at an unimaginable rate.